Hi, I'm Regina Taylor. I'm the curator of the Black Album Mixtape, and I'm so happy that I'm being joined by Ms. Tosha Story. Thank you. How are you today? I am fantastic. How are you, Regina? It's so good to see you again. Oh, great to see you. Thank <laughs> you for supporting the Black Album Mixtape. Now, we're both from SMU, Dallas, Texas. Right. Pony up. <laughs> Go Mustangs, yeah. How did you come to SMU? Well, I, um, you know, I was raised in Dallas, Texas and uh, go Cowboys. <laughs> and I went to the Arts Magnet School of Performing Arts at Booker T. Washington. Yes. And- um, Great school. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. And I actually, you know, if I just take it back a little further, I didn't even know I would be able to go to college because I came from some humble beginnings, uh, grew up in the projects there in, in Dallas, Texas. And so- Same here. I had a so amazing uh, team of, of teachers and counselors who believed in me and they were like, you're going to college. I'm like, I am, <laughs> we don't have any money. And so they encouraged me to apply to different colleges and scholarships and everything. And starting out thinking I wasn't going to any colleges and then end up being accepted to like 15. And wow. SMU was among them and- You were accepted at 15? 15. How did that work? Well, you know, you apply and then you get accepted and then you have to decide. But, you know, for me, you know, because I had a team of teachers who are still in my yes. life at this point, my godmother, she's now my godmother, Karen Francois, and lots of Nedra James and all that. So they were like, you're going to college. So I'm applying for scholarships and auditioning for different colleges. You know how that goes, you know, as, a, as an actor, you have to go to the colleges and audition and, and all of that. And so I got accepted to a lot of colleges and I was just like, whoa, like me? Y'all on me. And then SMU um, blessed me with a full scholarship. And mm. the program at that time was very selective. I think it was like 10, 10 actors that they accept per year. Mm. And I was one of them. And I was so honored and so happy uh, that one, I'd be going to college. And two, that they would be supporting me through it. And yes. so um, I was just blessed in that way. And actually ended up getting two degrees from, from SMU. But acting was was my major, one of my majors, yes. And what was the other? Um, African-American history. Oh, well, wonderful. Yes. How did you find your time at SMU? Time, really nice. I left, I, I remember calling my mother and go, Ma, I'm moving. <laughs> so I, once I left home, I stayed on campus, even through the summers, mm -hmm. uh, working or what have you. And so um, educationally, I thought it was a profound um, education. Um, you know, there were times, if I'm honest, because it's, it's a pretty Eurocentric school. And so there are times that, you know, culturally, you know, I felt um, a little deprived, but then I found that in, in one, of, why my, one of my majors is African American history. I right. found that in pledging Delta Sigma Theta sorority and just found my communities of people who look like me and have the same um, concerns as I. And so overall, they were very, very supportive. And I enjoyed the stay and I enjoyed making the connections that I did with, you know, everybody, but especially people of my, of the same culture. Yes. At that point, uh, what was the turn for you to know that you wanted to be in this industry, to be an actress? Um, did you have some other plans um, before uh, that led you then to, um, think that this was the way to go yeah well I used to think I was going to be a singer you know because that's just you know what I know because you know I grew up like I said in the project and, and it wasn't a lot of creativity you know it was you had to kind of fight and struggle to survive and so being a so creative, it was it was always to be an entertainer well when I was in like I said growing up there was a guy who would always do talent shows Mm. He grab us in the, you know, and like, we're going to perform. And so we would do these talent shows in the- No, the no. Which, which projects did you grow up in? Calvary Arms. Okay. Yes. Calvary uh -huh. Arms by Maynard Jackson. Yes. And yes. We're down now. Uh -huh. But, and so his name was Rufus. I'll never forget him. I wish I could find him. But he would always grab all the kids around and he's like, we're doing a talent show. You know, that was our creative outlet. Yes. And because of that, you know, I started singing, you know, just because I thought, oh, I can- you know, kind of sing a little bit. So I was, you know, singing, doing the talent shows. And then I went to Griner, um, middle school. And I thought, okay, I'll just be in the choir and just, you know, figure out what I'm gonna do. 
And Miss Perry, actually, who was a mind teacher there, she said to me, young lady, you should come and join our mind troop. And I'm like, mind? I've never heard of what? Mind? Oh. And I said, okay. So I started doing mind. And that kind of, you know, it introduced me to acting and theater. Yeah. And then from there, she encouraged me to go to Arts Magnet because they had a mind troop. Oh. And then that's how I got to arts. And then I was able to do acting, singing, everything all in one. And it just, I just remember how I, I felt like I was breathing yes. in that creative space, finally. Mm -hmm. So that's how I discovered it. How did your, your people take that? You wanted to be um, a singer, wanted to be an actress. Was there a lot of support for you? Well, yes, because my mother was a single parent and basically mm -hmm. she was just so focused on you know, raising us and trying to make sure that we have food to eat and clothing that it was long as you do something with your life, then I'm good. <laughs> so I only had, you know, my mom and she was just really good. If I did something, I did a play, she would come and support it. My sister was in ROTC. My right. brother was, you know, did the band. So she was the kind of mother that it was as long as we were doing something productive with our lives, then she was supportive. Absolutely. Wonderful. I know that when I went to SMU, I was a journalism major, switched it over to theater acting and people thought I lost my mind. Really? Wasting all that money, good, hard earned money on doing what? Oh, wow. Uh, was, was, the first, was the first reaction. Uh, but my mother was always very supportive in whatever direction I wanted to go in. That's oh. so interesting. I didn't know that. That's a little known fact. Uh, 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 it, it is important to have that person, uh, if it's one person, uh, whispering in your ear, you can do this. And that's really great that you had the support of your family. You know, and I just want to add to that, that, you know, just having the support of my family was amazing. Mm -hmm. But I think also what helped to change the trajectory of my life was the teachers there mm. at Arts Magnet High School. Mm. Mm -hmm. I tell this story, but, but it's important in terms of how it's changed me into the woman that I am today. But mm -hmm. I remember going there my freshman year and you know all I knew about was kind of fighting and you know just being disruptive or what have you. And Arts Magnet you know, had never had a fight. And I, was, I had the first and last fight there at the school. Mm. Crazy. Mm. And I remember my English teacher there, who's now my godmother, Carol Francois, was like, young lady, what are you doing? We don't do that here. And I'm like, huh? <laughs> you know? And I, I met some of the most amazing people in that hallway that day, them breaking up this, this fight. Uh, but then they started pouring into my life and they saw things in me that I never saw in myself. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, my first time ever flying on the airplane was my teacher, Carol Francois, who's my godmother now. But she was like, you're going to go and compete in this competition. It was called AXO competition. Mm -hmm. She said, you're going to go and compete in this competition. And I'm going to make sure you get there. Because I was like, I, I can't go to Baltimore. She made sure that I, I had a flight to go to Baltimore. Nedra James, who's a teacher of mine, I didn't, we didn't have a car. So she let me get my license in her car. When I went to college at SMU, Carol Francois, Nedra James, Mary March, they made sure I had towels and sheets and bicycle and everything that I needed in order for me to, to pursue this thing called acting. Mm -hmm. And from that day, even until this, they're still in my life and, you know, my family, as well as those amazing Black women who saw this gift in me and yes. made me channel that gift yes. and supported me through it. Um, and I'm just forever grateful to them because it, it takes a village. And I was yes. just blessed to have that kind of village that saw that, that strength in me. And so I have to give them, you know, I have to give All them a praise. Praise where I go. Yes, amazing. wonderful. Yeah. Uh, it does take a village. Yes. When you graduated from SMU, uh, what do you believe were your choices? Well, when I graduated from SMU, I was a little scared because I know this journey of acting. And I know that I, I know I knew that I loved it. I knew that it was really the pulse of, of who I was. Um, but again, you're, you're so often waiting on someone to say yes. And knowing that it you, you don't know. So I got a you know, I got a real job <laughs> too when I graduated. I worked for Sprint for a while um, until I got my bearings and got to meet, you know, to do 
uh, some plays in Dallas, Dallas Theater Center. I even right. had an opportunity to work with you on Crowns. Uh, I, I, I remember the day that you came in uh, for Crowns and just so shining, so stunning and uh, new. Uh, I wanted to have you as part of this. Really, it was an amazing group of just fierce women. Uh, really, uh, such a great and shining group. Uh, and, and you, and, and you too. I, I tell people every day, you know, so we did crowns. Somebody, I said, well, if Regina Taylor didn't direct crowns, I don't know if you did crowns. <laughs> you uh, just were um, stellar and, and, and impeccable in one, in your writing, but, but two, in your direction. And you just made, I tell people that was probably one of the hardest shows I've ever done on stage because of the dancing and the music and the not stopping and all that. But it was the most magical moment for me in terms of an actress. And it just really, you helped to just to elevate me to, a, to another level. And so for that, I am forever grateful and just honored to have worked with you. Your performance is imprinted on my brain and in my heart, in my spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought you were just so lovely, so beautiful, and so great in that role. Of Thank you so Anna. much. Just gorgeous. Thank yes. you. Yeah, so I, I started doing, you know, theater and, you know, in, in Dallas, Texas. And then I, you know, got married and had a family. And so I thought, okay, this is, um, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to continue to work here in Dallas, Texas. And I, you know, then I started directing and I'm loving directing plays. Too. Yes, yes. And that's the wonderful thing is that you go back and forth. Yes. You've done films, you've done TV, and you always go back to theater. And uh, not only in terms of acting, but also as a director. Oh, my God. I, you know, getting on the boards, as we say, is really like the gem to me of acting. I mean, television film is it's absolutely amazing. It's a beautiful genre. But in, in addition to that though, I always want to like get on stage at least once a year. Mm. It's just a fine tuning. It, it make you get What to is the in. difference? What is the difference between acting for a TV film and acting for theater? For me, the magic you get to experience in the moment, right? The, the technical parts are all set up and done through rehearsal. You know, you got your tech, you know, costume, all that. But when it's time to run that, story that play from the beginning to the end you have to live in that moment there's no cut okay retake okay let's go okay let's get that angle okay boom, boom. no that experience is is that experience and the beauty of it to me is every night it's a different show okay. it's a different experience and you get to grow in each performance yes so you know in a in a regional theater play obviously you get to rehearse for a month and then you get to run for a month and your performance from the opening to the ending, in my opinion, should be almost the night and day because you get to grow in that person and honor that person who you're playing. And the audience is a part of that journey, which is very different than television and film because, you know, as you know, um, you know, the audience doesn't get it until sometimes months, years later. And so you don't know what the response is or the reaction is or whatever. And sometimes the audience just even infuses your, your performance, you know? And it's just a, it's a beautiful symphony to me, the stage. And I feel completely alive because magic happens. The collaboration with the director and the actors, and then you get to play and this doesn't work. Okay, try this and this doesn't work, try this. In intelligent film, it's, you don't get as much liberty you don't have as much time uh -huh. so you pretty much have to kind of you know, make some choices and decisions and kind of hope they work <laughs> yes uh, so uh, after you graduated uh what was your first uh, professional gig my first professional gig and in, in terms of television because stage is professional as well in terms of television was the road to Galveston. Oh, with, with Cicely, Cicely Tyson. Tyson. Yes. And I was so um, moved uh, hearing about her passing. Yeah. Uh, everything yeah. she's done. A 96. Just, just uh, leading the way. Uh, we are here because of her. Yes, we are. Because of, yeah. and I, I think of all the different roles, uh, groundbreaking roles that she did. So she, that was your first. Um, mm -hmm. She paved oh. the way. And what's 
what was so magical about that was, you know, in studying theater in high school and then in college, you know, you know, you know, Miss Cicely Tyson is the constant, yeah, yeah. okay? And yeah. so as you study, you're studying her. Yeah. And never would I have thought that I would be working with her, yeah. like side by side, face to face. Yes. And so that was just such a, that was just such a blessing for me and a confirmation that yeah. I'm on the right path and purpose. Yes. Um, and so- what was, I, what was it that she gave to you? Uh, what did you take away from that experience? Her discipline. That was a very disciplined actress. Mm -hmm. I remember when I walked on set, the director said, okay, now her name is Sugar. <laughs> so it's not, it's not Cecily Tyson. It's that she's called by her character. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. okay. I never heard of her. Okay, no problem. And so- Always I, in character. Always, mm -hmm. always. And so even between takes, she never drops the character. Mm -hmm. She is constantly, it's, 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 the, it's the consummate concept of, I am this person living this life. Yes. This what we're trained to do as actors. But you know, we drop and get in and whatever and turn it on and turn it off. But she would actually live the life of the actress. Mm -hmm. I remember as I watched her, even when let's say someone rapped, you know, and they'll say, okay, it's a rap for such and such. And you know how they clap, right? She would be in her corner, still focused, never breaking. And I thought, wow, the commitment to this woman that she's playing was, it was, it was, it was amazing to watch her off screen and how she kept that commitment, you know, and then would bring it onto screen. It, it was just, it was just beautiful. And I just thought I will forever work hard on everything that I do. And I may not master everything, but I'm going to give everything 100%. And I'm never going to be too comfortable that I'm phoning anything in because I'm looking at this woman who has a vast amount of work behind her. And, and as we know, many more years in front of her, but her commitment to that role and that character, it was, it was honorable. And for me, I thought I will always be committed to every role that I do 100%. Uh, your, your next big break was with the Oprah Winfrey Network. Uh, can you tell us about, uh, what you were doing in um if loving in, you is wrong if loving you is wrong when i moved to los angeles i moved there i divorced and i moved there as a single parent didn't know anyone so mm -hmm. i was really just trying to find my way i just made a decision and so i did a you know a few guest stars and co-stars here or there but i had my son and i didn't want to compromise you know his his life and his lifestyle. And I never wanted to leave him for what I was doing. And I wanted to make sure he was normal and had all everything he needed. So I, I did little roles here and there. And then when he graduated, I just decided, okay, it's time. Graduate from high school. And I said, okay, it's time for me to really focus on, on me. And I had made a decision really that I was going to say, oh, you know what, I'm in Atlanta, LA, but I'm going to go you know, on vacation with my mom in Atlanta. And I'm going to see if I can get in front of Tyler Perry or someone just to kind of you know, cause I'm not 20 anymore. So let me just figure out how I can kind of get in there quicker. And something about manifestation is, is pretty powerful because as I was speaking those words and getting ready to kind of go, my mom and I were going to meet in Atlanta and then I was going to stay a month. All of a sudden I have to say out of nowhere because I've had an agent who hadn't called me on anything in a while because I was so focused on raising my son, mm. but I got in this audition and it was like, you have an audition for the show called Love Me Is Wrong with Tyler Perry. I was like, wait, wait what? Because I, here I am packing, gonna go there just so that I can try to figure out if I can get to an agent that can get me in front of a couple of people or whatever in, in Atlanta. And I thought, mm. this is weird because I just put this in the universe. And so she said, and it's tomorrow and it's like 10 pages. I was like, oh Lord, okay. So I was like, okay, no, because this is God and I am going to get this done. And so I went, auditioned for that show, If Loving You Is Wrong and booked it the next day. And that was my you know, my guest star, a recurring guest star. Well, actually it was just was supposed to be a guest star. So hmm. I got, got to Atlanta and I did the audition. I mean, did the, the, um, the episodes that he wanted me to do. And then I went to him and I said, Mr. Perry, thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me. He's like, where are you going? I said, well, you know, I've wrapped. And he goes, oh, no, 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 I'm writing some more. Oh, no. Oh, wow. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> right. And so it turned, you know, from one episode, it turned to like seven yes. and, um, you know, that was beautiful. And then from then on, I just, you know, I just decided, I, you know, I'm going to focus finally on me and my craft and 
what I want to do while I'm here in LA. And you know, I just started, you know, working after that. And it was, um, it was pretty amazing. Right. And you continue uh, as a muse for Mr. Tyler Perry, in that you have continued to work with him on several projects, yes. including the Oval. Yes, yes. I um, Then next with him, I mean, I did, you know, like uh, some Lifetime movies and a couple other things. But with him, I ended up doing um, Acrimony, the movie. Yes, yes. And I played Raji P. Henson's. Her older sister, sister. the mean one. <laughs> 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 and so I was able to do that and that was fantastic and just working with Tar Taraji was amazing yes. um, as well and, and Lyric and then from there I ended up doing Empire um, right. played China on that and that was wonderful yeah. and, and it's really interesting how one door opening leads yes. other doors uh, it is a tribe you're developing family it's really great when you can continue to work over and over again uh, with familiar people Yes, absolutely. And, you know, when people can put a word in for you, because I know even with um, with Empire, I remember <clears throat> after working with Taraji on Acrimony, mm -hmm. um, my agent was trying to get me in, you know, to audition or whatever. And then she just made a phone call. It's like, well, she wants to audition. Let her, you know, audition. I was like, oh, good. So I was able to audition and book the role and, and get in. So, you know, God just constantly sends me angels and I'm just, I'm just grateful for them. What has been your favorite role? Oh, Gina. Mm. That's a good question. I don't know yet because I think it's yet to come. Mm -hmm. You know, I am, I've enjoyed, all of them are so different. I mean, I play yes. a prison woman in, in Empire and then I'm a gangster mom and if love me exactly. is wrong now, I'm a sweet, you know, uh, uh, supposedly wholesome woman in, in um, the Oval and I'm also doing The Young and the Restless now. Right. Um, as well. Yes, there is. You you show all of this range. You show all of these women uh, who uh, have a grounding. You know, no matter what type of woman she is, uh, you bring your own grounding yes. to them, and it's really wonderful to watch. Oh, that, thank you. That means a lot coming from you. <laughs> um, I just think I'm enjoying telling stories. Mm. I enjoy, you know, because. I tell people that obviously acting, the training is, you know, you have to do the work, mm -hmm. but life experiences is also a part of them. When you can couple them yes. and bring them and infuse them into your work, then I think that's where the magic happens. And so, you know, being a parent has, has helped me. Yes. You are the mother to a son yeah. uh, that is African American. What, what is the most important uh, bit of wisdom that you have given him. And he's also an actor. He is an actor. And believe me, he's a, he's a, he's a graduate of USC on uh, communications. And I was like, I'm thinking, okay, he's not doing this acting thing. We're good, right? And he graduates <laughs> and it's like, mom, here's your degree, but I'm gonna act. I was like, what? I love the, I love the work, you know, and the industry. What did, he get, what did he get a degree in? Communications, yes. And I, and I love, you know, this industry that we're in, but I know the struggle and I know the journey. And so as a parent and as a mom, I was like, I, I just wanted him to be in something that was safe, <laughs> you know, but he's, you know, decided he wants to act and I'm happy that he has a degree if he needs to fall back on or what have you. And he's doing really well. So, I'm, you know, I'm really happy for him in that role. And so I, I can't tell you how much wisdom I've tried to, to give my son throughout this life's journey, you know, as well as this acting journey. He does a whole skit about all the all the sayings that I have, you know, like don't let nobody pee in your, your face and tell you it's raining. <laughs> you know, I come up with so many things. He was like, okay, got it, mom. But um, overall, I want him to be, and I tell him this all the time that, you know, while I'm a, I am a single parent and I had to raise him in that way, him being an African-American male, you know, I, I want him to lead his family. Mm -hmm. And I, I said to him that, in my opinion, we, we are out of order in terms of, you know, there should be a man and a woman and then they're with a the family and, and raising the, the child. And so I want you to go in knowing that when you choose your wife and you, you have children that you need to be present because they're gonna need your leadership. And that's really important to me because he's grown up knowing that, you know, the mother is the head because 
you know, we've had to, you know, we had some lemons and we made lemonades and this is uh, the cards that we're dealt, but that's not necessarily how it should be. And so I want him to know that as a man and as a leader that um, he can stay, choose wisely and stay committed, raise, be the leader of his family and raise his children. So that's really, really important to me. So I instill that all the time. And, and, and secondly, we talk about it all the time that unfortunately we live in this world where color matters. He went to private schools. And so he was very like naive to the fact that, you know, and he's a, he's a beautiful chocolate brother. Okay. <laughs> he is Michael Jordan chocolate. I just love it. And um, so <laughs> he is, he is. You, you he is. did, you, you did birth a beautiful son. Thank you. Thank you. And I want, I want him to know who he is and know and live in his power. And no matter what's going what on. What does that mean? Live in his power. Yes. That he is a strong African-American Black brother in this world that can lead, that does not have to be submissive uh, or, 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 or inferior to anyone because of the color of your skin. That your skin means power. That when you're, because he went to, like I said, he went to, he went to Brentwood School, which is a private school, and um, he went to USC, you know, so it's pretty predominantly, you know, white, and and he's able to navigate himself through that, which I love about him, and not have and, to and you too, you too, Thank have you. to navigate. Yes, um, yes. In terms and he of didn't assimilate, and, I, and, and that's what I love about him so is he is still who he is. He has his fro, you know, and he loves it and he walks in his, in the power of who he is. He's first God's child, he's my child, but he's his own man and he's a proud black man. And he exudes it in everything he does. And I think that's the best thing I, I think I've, I've given to him, I, I've always told him how beautiful he is and how I love that he's mannerable and he's respectful uh, and he's honorable and he's polite, but he's, he's knowledgeable and he understands this world. And so there were times when, you know, for example, there was an incident where when he was in high school and he was at Brentwood School and he was in a restaurant with all of his friends and he and, and Patrick Schwarzenegger's son, actually, they were in a restaurant. They were all, you know, just playing around. They were all fun, having a good time. And then uh, someone knocked the drink out of Jordan's hand and it spilled on the floor in the restaurant. And then the, the waiter, who happened to be white, came around and told my son, hey, you need to clean that up. And this is a restaurant. Yeah. And, I, and so my son, you know, he, again, he, he's not clear on what's going on. He was like, huh? Like one, I didn't do it, but I need to clean it up. The guy came and brought him a towel and said, if you don't clean this up, you're not gonna get to come in here anymore. And my son, cause he wow. said, I felt like something was wrong with that mind. So I didn't, that man picked my baby up by his backpack and his, and tossed him out of the restaurant. Wow. All his friends. Mm. Now, you know, <laughs> when I got wind of that, you, I, you know, and I'm having flashbacks when I think about it, but. I think I flew up all kind of traffic and everything just to get there. And the school was very supportive. Um, you know, it was found that it was true and the guy was fired and we sued and, and I gave Jordan every penny of it. But that was a teachable moment Yes. for me with him to say that everybody's not like this, but there are people out there who see you differently. And the fact that you stood up for yourself, you get to do that. And I wanted to sue them because I wanted them to, I wanted him to know that if you are mistreated in this manner, you can stand up and you can speak for yourself. And so I, it was a whole year of me every day in and out, making sure that my son knew that one, I was fighting for him, but two, he would win. And he did. And the whole school, I mean, the, the, the owner came to the school and had an assembly. I told my, that owner, I need you to apologize to my son in front of everybody in this school because he was humili humiliated in front of a lot of his friends. And so he did that. And I mean, the school rallied around, they, the, the, the restaurant closed down because of the support that the school had behind him. And so it was, it was a, it was a, it was a life-changing moment for him that he now understood that this world is not all peaches and cream. And some of the things that I would tell him, he'd be like, ma, it's not like that anymore. It's not like that anymore. Mm. And he understood that it was. And so you know, when he's around his friends, you know, and they're in Bel Air and in Brentwood or whatever, and he's leaving at one in the morning and I'm on pins and needles, I'm saying to him, 
that you're a black young man in this community. And if they stop you, they're not gonna automatically assume that you have friends in the neighborhood. So I need you to call me immediately, be obedient, put, you know, put your both hands on, I mean, going through the whole spiel just so that my, to make sure that my son comes home alive. Right. So unfortunately I've had to instill that in him too. Yes. But I want him alive, I want him alive. Mm. Do you think it would be much different raising an African-American girl, female? Yes, I do. What, what would be the difference? Regina, I think that there's a, there's a major threat. People are threatened by strong black men. And when people are threatened, they are scared. Mm -hmm. They're in fear. So when people are in fear, then they wanna kind of minimize whatever they think that power is, mm -hmm. right? And women, I mean, you know, I'll just say I've been pulled over a couple of times, whatever. And, you know, I can blurt my way out of it sometimes. <laughs> I can, you know, be like, oh, man. but it's just something about a black man that everybody is fear fearful of. I mean, in terms of the, the, the white woman, and these are my words, in my opinion, the, the white male. And I, I think they're afraid that they're going to take over and rule the world. I, I don't know. But whatever that mentality is from back in slavery has continued to manifest in generations to come until today. And I think it just needs to stop. Mm -hmm. I think that the fact that I'm a black mother and I gotta be scared for my son's life. Like the th when I think about it, I wanna cry. On a constant basis. Yes. That he can't just hang out with his white friends and have fun and enjoy and not fear that he might be treated differently should something happen. The fact that I can't sleep when he's out because I don't know what's happening in the streets, you know, and I just want him to come home safe. You hear so many stories. We know, I mean, of so many stories of just a simple, a simple car being pulled over, a simple light being out, a simple, you know, maybe he was speeding a little bit and it turns into a life being taken. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be that black mom. So I'm constantly, Jordan, okay, so, you know, he doesn't live with me anymore. He has his own place, but I'm still worried. So I'm going, Jordan, so, you know, when you do this, and he goes, mom, mom, but I'm on pins and needles constantly because I know what this world looks like. And while I've experienced racism, I mean, you know, me going to SMU and, or just being about life and somehow, I don't think it, it impacts women as much as it does men because, well, I don't want to minimize that because there are some women who've been their lives. I, I agree. We think about Sandra Bland. Yeah. And, yeah. and um, so I, I can't really say that. I guess because I have a boy and I don't have a girl, <laughs> you know, and me being a girl, I did experience I some, but not to the point that I felt like my life was in danger. And right. I know my son was like, you know, he got pulled over. He was, then he's all scared because he's like, I, I want to make the right move. And it's like, you shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't have to be that way. It, it just shouldn't. And here we are today we are. having this discussion. I, I feel uh, in this body, someone was telling me, I was going to uh, someplace overseas that was war-torn. And they're saying, aren't you afraid going there? And I had to think about it. Uh, my fear level, going mm -hmm. to a war-torn country in this body. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I went, oh, well, there's always something in the back of my mind that I have to be watchful, that I have to be careful yeah. in this body, no matter where I stand. Uh, and that's from childhood up to this day. So if my child then is male or female or transgendered, I, I think there would always be in me this watchfulness, uh, something in the pit of my stomach when they're not present with me. Yeah. I think about uh, coming of age at a certain time and integrating white institutions early on. Mm. I think about my mother putting me on that bus to go on the other side of town because mm. she couldn't see me. What faith that took. Yeah and praying that you would come home whole, you know? Yes. You would come home whole. Yes. yes. Absolutely. I, I think there is that from then to now, and here we are in 2021, and we're still having these same conversations and these same fears for our children. 
And I, I want to say that it's shocking, but it really isn't. <laughs> you know what I mean? I just wish it were, were a shock. But so many people are bereft of the, the power of just honoring different people in different cultures. And I, I, and I know it's instilled from, you know, back in the day and you don't know what, you know, because what your parents teach you is kind of what you, you, you know, you're going to go with. And so I, I, I think the generation now is, is a little more conscious than maybe the generation before, generations before, but the thought of, to me, of having to feel bad because of the way God made me, uh -huh. to feel less than uh -huh. because of the way God made me. Yes. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, it, it's just hard for how me. Do you, how do you instill that power in a child? I know with my mother, she instilled it through the arts. I am always known I was a writer. Mm. My mother taught me how to write children's books from the age of four years old. Ooh. She was very mindful in giving me that gift to be able to create, to dream and create and to create worlds where this little chocolate girl was in the center of it, navigating her way through. through. That was very empowering. Yes. That was a wonderful gift. She was a teacher and she knew what she was doing. We have to be able to write our own stories. Stories. Wow, that, that's magical. Mm -hmm. And going back then to Cicely Tyson, you know, that wonderful gift that that was your entryway was this amazing woman who was like trailblazing her way through with these images for us to hold on to. Absolutely. As we were saying, yes, we can. Yes, we can. And I was going to say that, you know, while I didn't have a lot of, you know, growing up the way I did, you know, the arts wasn't a part of my, my family, really. I'm the first artist, so to speak. But watching television and seeing, you know, people who, who look like me, like yes. Cypher, and yes. going, that's why, you know, it was always she was going to be a far reach for me. So the fact to be in the same room and in the same scene with her was like, you know, it was just crazy to me, but just, you know. Yes, and, and, and now today, that's what you're doing. You're setting up these images for others to say, oh, well, that's me. And you, and you have wow. such a, a wide range and you say, oh, oh, and that's me. And that's me. Wow, that's true. And that's, that's what you're about. Oh, that's so, you know what? I just never think of it because I feel like I have, I, I haven't arrived yet. And so, you know, and the people. Oh, well, like, well. Uh, what is that? You know, I, I, I think you have arrived. It, there is that difference. What was that? What was that shift for you when you're walking down the street and someone walked up to you and and said, I know you. Uh, what was that like? It's it's humbling. What really? was that? And what was that like? Well, I, I, just, I remember being in the airport. And again, I don't you know, because I it's hard sometimes for me to make the shift because I just know that as actors, we just, we want to be working actors and right. it's what we do. And so for me, it's like, I, you know, I want to be, I'm, just, I'm working on this person, trying to bring this person to life and I'm going to try to bring this person to life. So that's kind of where my mind is. So if I'm flying or whatever, I'm just thinking, and then somebody rec recognized me. I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. I am. <laughs> oh, that's right. Okay. Thank you. You know, but it, it was, um, it was gratifying in a way that I have met some goals that I set out for myself. Mm -hmm. It's gratifying in a way when people say to me, like for example, on uh, The Young and the Restless, and I, I'm playing a woman who gave her her, her twins for, uh, for adoption when she was younger. Yes. And one of my family members called me crying and said that that was their life. And that to be able to tell that story made them, you know, confirm what they already knew about, you know, if they were loved or if they, so when you, you know, we do this to inspire, to enlighten, to elevate, you know, all those things. And so when people recognize me, one, but two, tell me that they've been moved in some way or another, mm -hmm. that doubles the blessing for me. Mm -hmm. And it's even more shocking now during COVID. You know, we're wearing masks and everything. I'm walking, I'm taking a walk. And this guy on the bus stop, I'm, you know, I'm walking around the forum area. And this guy on the bus stop, he was like, you on that show, you on that show at all, aren't you? And I'm like, you can tell with my mask on and I'm walking. He was like, I can tell by those eyes. <laughs> let's you know that you have arrived. Yeah, okay. Yes. Okay, I'll receive that. <laughs> and that. showing the different facets, yeah. different facets 
but different layers of who we are. I think yes. it's important with, with its brilliance, with its tragedy, with its humor, yes. uh, all of that. Yes. Um, to see all of us. All of us. Uh, as Including our mistakes. Yes. You know, as because, you know, even on, even on the oval, but also on Young and Restless, it's like these are women, women who made some really bad choices mm -hmm. that have affected the lives of other people. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's it, in a way, because I have to not judge them, but to honor them, knowing mm -hmm. that there are people out there, you know, showing like, us with complexity. Yes, absolutely. And it's like, you're, you know, you're, you're more than your last mistake. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that you can keep going in okay. spite of your choices, you can make another choice. You may not have made the right decision, but you can make the decision right. And so just being able to, you know, to enlighten in that way through my work is a blessing. So it feels like we're going through some type of renaissance of black culture. Of, uh, there's so much work. Uh, people are creating so much work and uh, creating this content. And there are places, new places, yep. For this content to live, creating new audiences. Yeah, uh, what's that about? Well, I think, and unfortunately, it you know it had to come through the whole George Floyd debacle. I call it because I just think it was just ridiculous that that had to happen. His life had to be taken in that manner. Huh. That the world was able to see what we already see and know and feel. They were able to see it for their with their own eyes. You know, mm -hmm. we talk about it, but then they think, oh, you're complaining, oh, you're being militant, all that. But to be able to see it and experience it, you know, his living, his living and dying was not in vain. And I'm just so grateful that at least that part, you know, happened. Wish he was still on earth, but if he had to pass, that it would be, you know, an awakening. And I think that was the impetus of an the awakening. New conversations. Yes. New conversations. Yes. And we've had these conversations before, Virginia, yes. when something happens. Yes. You know, Trayvon Martin happened. The, but it just seems like something really resonated. Something it, it, shifted. It shifted. And was that a combination of, of, of this along with people having to sit down? They couldn't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. A lot of people uh, had to sit down and take in everything that was going on. Had to. And be reflective, have time to be reflective. To, that's so beautiful. And it's to true. To reflect on the state of the world. Yes. Uh, you cannot take your eyes away at mm -hmm. times. Uh, and being accountable, like I feel like- And be accountable, yes. For the first time that people are being more accountable of their part, of the part uh -huh. that they play in this, you mm -hmm. know, because, you know, racism is institutionalized. It's, 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 you know, you, you reap the benefits of it. So therefore you think, oh, well, you know, it wasn't me, it was my dad, it was my mom. But people are being more accountable going, wait a minute, this is happening. And while, you know, it's not me doing it, but you know, people around me are doing it. I'm not saying anything when people are doing it. So I feel like that we have, a, that, that, that we have support now. It's not just us fighting for ourselves because it still makes it separate. It takes a village, it takes everybody. So everybody. when people of different, races come out and they go no you're treating them wrong no black lives do matter and no we're not i know my i matter but they, they matter too i mean when they can get it and hear it and say it and support it then i think that you know then it, it's a louder voice it's a louder voice even in our industry and in what we're doing right. you know they're seeing that the pay grade is different why yeah. are you a part of the problem like why should it be we're doing the same thing why is that so um, looking at the, the casting, are you telling me that, you know, that because you're black, you're less of an actor than because you're white or, you know, of other nationalities? I mean, your gift is your gift. And so even our stories are being told and, and they're, they're even content. There's more, even more content that's being um, taken on as a go, a green, green lit. Yes. And, and, and there's no more, oh, we can't put a Black person in the lead because people don't want to watch. Yes. That whole myth has been dispelled. It's been dispelled. It has. And so I think we're not where we need to be, but we are, we are, we're getting further. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because of the united front that's happening in accordance with that. And yes. I think if everybody, if they keep that going and it's a, it's a united uh, front, then it'll continue to change. I, I saw on the news the other day where 
they're looking at black uh, Dr. Oz, I think, thinking it was 5% black doctors, you know, and that he's he he is making a, an effort to to look into that to see why is that so? Mm -hmm. And even in, in in sports with with head football, uh, not football, uh, with the head coaches, yes, the percentage is low and you know, quarterbacks, the percentage is low. And they're actually just taking a look at this world and realizing that whether you're personally racist or not, it is racist in, in institutionalized into a system that we are all benefiting from, or they, you know what I mean? And if you're benefiting from it and you're not speaking about it, then you're a part of the problem. Right. And I'm just grateful that people are seeing that now and they're speaking out. And I think ultimately, you know, it will bring about a change. <laughs> right, people are speaking about it all across the board. Oh yeah. Uh, usually we speak about it in terms of black and white. Yeah. Uh, our stories are being um, told in this moment in time. Uh, people are, are looking for content that is specifically uh, black, yeah. uh, black characters, black issues. Uh, we still are banging on doors, but we're also given the opportunity to create our own platforms in this moment in time. Uh, in this time, uh, too, in the time of COVID, we are having more and more people self-produce. Mm -hmm. So that takes away some of the gatekeepers. Uh, it's now in the Oscar Michaud uh, type uh, field of doing it ourselves and creating our own audiences. Mm -hmm. And there are audiences, a wide range of audiences mm -hmm. that, that will follow. I think that's really very exciting time to be an artist right now. It is. And we have the pioneers who will continue to, to make way, you know, Tyler Perry's, the Oprah Winfrey's, um, you, you know, it's, yes. you, they, they've set the example, you know, for us so yeah. that you don't have to have the mentality that I had when I graduated from college, which was, I just want somebody to say yes to me. Mm. Now we have an avenue of which we can produce our own things. Yes. Tell our own stories and value our stories. You don't have to wait for somebody to go, well, that's a good story. No, it's our life. It's our story. Yes. And so to be able to do that um, or have the opportunity to do that and, and know that they're, you know, because live streaming, it's so many different ways to watch everything. The world right. has just changed in that way. And so it just gives us an opportunity, you know, and, and not just our, you know, not just black and brown people, but Asian people, whomever. To, to now be valued as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a strong people who who has a voice and something, a valued voice that we want to shout and tell the world that this is who we are. We're not just one way. And I think, you know, how the industry used to be, you only just saw one way. It was somebody was slave, you know, made or whatever. And there was that. But then there's so many other aspects to who we are. Right. And, and there's I'm, usually only one. Yes, or two. grateful to be able to see how vast yes. and that we are and that they can appreciate all of it instead of rele relegating us to just this one, this one thing. Right, yes, so it's, it's, it's a very exciting time. Uh, uh, can you talk about uh, filming during the time of COVID? Ooh -wee. Um, yes, I can. <laughs> this is, um, one, let me just say, I've been blessed to actually be able to work Yes. Uh, during COVID. Uh, yes. So, you know, I, I won't complain, but just the, the process in itself is just very different. I mean, I'm here now in Atlanta uh, shooting the third season of The Oval um, yes. with Tyler Perry. And, you know, Tyler Perry is very serious about this COVID thing. Yes. I have tested seven times before I got here. And when I got here, I've tested every single day. And it is, in fact, I tested today. <laughs> Um, and it is in an effort to make sure that we are able to work, but we are able to work in a safe environment. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, I'm grateful to him for that. And I think that um, it's because of that rigor uh, and regimen that, you know, I'm able to make a living even during COVID. Mm -hmm. um, I, I tell you, on, on Young and the Restless, it's a little different where they don't, we're not in a bubble. We do test often. But I get to go home because it's shot in LA. But what has changed is because they're not working in the bubble. And as an artist, you know, you're doing a scene and you still have to social distance during the scene. Mm. You mm. cannot, you know, there's a scene that I was supposed to hug my daughter. I, I can't touch her. No one can touch your stuff. You cannot 
you know, and so it's yeah. changed the dynamics of which you work. So how do you, if the script says you have to hug her, how, what do you do? You don't. Okay. <laughs> So somehow you have to show that love in your eyes or got it whatever but and that's that's um that's the challenge um you know for me and you know just not being able to you know and I think I was telling you earlier you know it has affected not only our work world but just our our life I mean I'm from the yes. south and you know I'm used to touching and hugging and you know that's just who I am and I have to constantly you know shut down from my normal you know the normal person that I am and, my instincts. And so even in a scene, you know, my instinct may be to touch or hug or whatever, you know how we do and You, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. um, even in rehearsal, you wearing a, you know, you're wearing a mask. And so it does, it, it does create a few boundaries that you kind of have to overcome. And, it, and, and, and it's compromised in a way in terms of the scene, because, you know, you're not able to do some, some real life things that you would do normally, you know, they're managing it and, and, and making it through. And so that's what we're doing. But I, I just can't wait until we get back to a sense of sense of normalcy, even in auditioning, you know, you know, talking about how COVID has affected us, you know, being, you know, you're so used to being able to go in the room and to meet the producer and, or, you know, the casting director and do it. And, and then they get to know you and your energy and, and all of that. It's gone. Right. Everyone is auditioning self tape that's what people are doing now. Okay. Self tapes. Oh. And I don't know if that's going to go back oh, to being God. back in the room again. People love the self tapes now. Uh, and I, I find that uh, that is challenging. It's challenging because you're having to be the director, technical director, and then the actress. And so, you know, mm -hmm. you're in your head sometimes when you need to be in your heart. Right. And, and that alchemy that happens when you're in the same room with someone. And maybe, you know, you give an okay audition, you know, in reading, but something happens in terms of a conversation between someone in a room that lets you know, oh, I think we would be great uh, working with each other. Yeah. Yes. And just missing that, that human connection. Yes. Um, it's, there's power in that. And I pray that we get to go back. <laughs> But I feel, I feel as you do that, you know, they have found some, you know, some positives in that. Yeah. And um, some things will stay. And, will stay. And, but okay. it has changed. It, everything has changed. Like it's from auditioning to working, even within the moments of the scenes, you know, it's all riddled by, by this COVID. And then me now, you know, I'm, we basically have to stay on Tyler Perry Studios, which it's not a bad thing. I mean, he takes care of us. You know, you get, you get a lot of food and, you know, and you get housing and it's, you know, it feels like college again. Um, so it's really, it's it nice to just, you know, connect with, you know, your, uh, you know, with the stars of the show and everything, but it's still different. And um, you don't have the autonomy that you had in, in, in so many ways, but I'm just grateful that even in that, that I'm able to, you know, to still be working and to provide for myself and to still be doing what I, what I love to do. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. And I just can't wait to get back to hugging and touching and all that good stuff because uh, it's all it's all like uh, tied up inside of me and I can't wait to just let it go. <laughs> yeah, we, we hold on to that which sustains us. Right. And the rest we let go and adapt. Mm, that's good. That's true. Mm -hmm. We are resilient. It's yeah. in the DNA. Yes. And, and now I'm looking forward to, you know, I, I mean, I understand that, LA has kind of opened up a little more and that the COVID, the COVID uh, vaccine is available to everyone. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm looking forward to actually getting the vaccine. Yes. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tosha. <laughs> oh, look, I feel like I'm just in the living room talking to you. It's been wonderful. <laughs> oh, it's great. It, it, it is great. It's great talking with you always. Oh, definitely. Bye. I just, again, I just want to say to you, that you too, you know, are in my eyes a pioneer. I mean, you, your work just speaks volumes, in, in, you know, in, on screen. And I watch you, and I am, you know, just forever moved and blessed by by your art. And I just want to thank you, you know, just for sharing that with the world. We appreciate you, thank and you. also for giving me this opportunity to talk with you. So it's been a blast. Thank you. I I appreciate you for this conversation in this moment. Yay, yay.